Welcome to the Pretty Intense Podcast. Today on the show is Kashif Khan. He is president and founder of The DNA Company. I was put on to Kashif over a year ago because I had breast implants and I thought I was sick from them, which I was. Kashif was doing genetic pathway research on why some women get so sick from breast implants. And so that's what started the relationship. I did his DNA test, which everybody is going to have access to 15% off. Go to thednacompany.com forward slash Danica and you'll get 15% off. Super fascinating test. The portal itself that you get with the information and your data is so easy to use. So I did that. So I was able to see what I do well, what I don't do well. So in this interview, we talked about genetics and just what are they and where did they come from and how do we change them and telomeres and age and how to reverse that. And really like a lot of it ends up boiling down to just how do we be healthier? Cash of himself, you hear in the interview, when he was 38, his biological age was 43. And now that he's 43, his biological age is 33. Really, really super smart guy. He developed this company in response to him being so sick. It comes from passion. I think you're gonna be able to feel that in this interview. He also has a book coming out called The DNA Way. I just think this is a must listen to interview and the DNA test is a must do test to really understand yourself to live your best life. Please hit subscribe and the bell for notifications when we have an episode come out and let me know your thoughts in the comments. Element is a tasty electrolyte drink with everything you need and nothing you don't. That means that there's lots of salt and no sugar. Element is formulated to help anyone with their electrolyte needs and is perfectly suited to any diet or lifestyle. For me, I drink Element all day, every day. I put it in just about every single drop of water that I drink. For me, it feels like it helps keep me full. It helps give me more energy. And I feel like water is absorbed better by the body when it has Element in it. It truly feels like magic to me. Receive a free Element sample pack with any order when you use drinkelement.com slash pretty intense. That's drinkelement.com slash pretty intense. So good to see you. Yeah, you too. I, I, was just, I just got off this other recording where did Mindy, Mindy tell you about the summit that we're doing together? No, what is it? So we're recording 40 interviews to have a female health event, online event. Uh, she's doing 10 of them. I'm doing 30 of them. And we're putting it all together into one massive, this is what all women need to know to be healthy type event online. Holy schnikes. Yeah. We just decided to come together and do it. So uh, thanks to you. Oh, uh, well, yeah. you guys are both like two of the most generous people in in particular in the field of health you know you guys have both helped me so much and that's an easy pairing you guys are both awesome people no oh, thank you yeah so that's coming out uh we're, we're shooting and then august it's gonna go live online can you give us a couple highlights so one of the big things that i'm seeing unfortunately is a lot of crazy rare and highly aggressive cancers Mm -hmm. And we, we all know why, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I talked to her about that a little bit. She didn't want to, but she opened up and she's really good with cancers. Like she, breast cancer doesn't scare her at all. She always fixes it. That was a big one because everyone I talked to and I asked the question, they don't really think about it. They're like, oh yeah, wait, now that you say it, there's a little too much of this going on. So there's no immune system and you need an immune system to constantly kill all the cancer cells that are in your body. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have one, they, they flourish and thrive. And these things that are now be called genetic cancers that are not genetic cancers, I can't mm -hmm. tell you how many people that are like in their 30s and 40s are getting stage four terminal type diagnosis. What is the basis of cancer? What is happening that causes cancer? There's inflammation, which is what we talk about, right? Yeah. Inflammation is the cells being unhealthy and essentially losing their function and aging and degrade. There's degradation that happens. Mm -hmm. um, but in order to, so then that cell becomes mutated, becomes cancerous, but your body is constantly fighting that with immunity. Right, mm -hmm. and we think of, of immune function as vitamin C and cold and flu season, but it's so much more. Your immune system is fighting everything all the time. And when you trigger immune suppression um, from things that have been going on, then you don't have that frontline defense to constantly fight the high levels of inflammation that we're suffering from based on our environment and our nutrition and our stressors and our lack of sleep. So there's a double whammy of we have way too much inflammation because of everything that's going on. And we lost our immune systems that were 
at least keeping it at bay so then all of a sudden things flourish that shouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. Why does it, why does inflammation make such a difference? Like expand, explain the pathway to cancer through inflammation. Inflammation is a necessary tool. Inflammation was our ancestors used to drop a hammer on their foot and they would have an inflammatory response, which would repair, repair that. But it would be a once in a while acute type scenario. Going to battle, get cut with the sword, body gets inflamed, repair, repair, repair. When the stressors are constant, everything you breathe and everything you eat and every relationship you have is constantly, you know, overburdensome, then that thing that we have in us that was designed to protect us becomes chronic and constant. And now the cells, which are constantly trying to repair and they're head to toe, you're in this state of crisis, right? And then there's a domino effect of hormone response and neurochemical response and all systems start to fail. 14 of the 15 top killers today are all rooted in inflammation. So this one thing, inflammation, is the disease that causes cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, et cetera, et cetera. The reason you get inflammation is different, but literally, if you pull out any CDC filing, you'll see that 14 of the top 15 killers are inflammation. And number three, which is the number one that's not one of the 14, is medical error. Doctors just making mistakes. That's yeah. the number three. Yeah. <laughs> number three cause of death in the US is medical error today. It's heart disease, cancer, and medical error. So if you get rid of inflammation, your chances of having the American dream of last, last 15 years are spent in treatment, sick in a bed, which is the typical average, is almost non-existent because most diseases can't happen. I want to understand it at more of a granular level. The energy of the body is redirected in a way that it shouldn't be. Some of the cells are suffocated. They are losing cell communication because of irregular inflammation or... How does it actually form these growths and things like that? A little bit of all of that is happening, okay. right? And the, the clinical explanation is um, sort of degradation, right? So mm -hmm. the cells are aging. And so what is aging? Aging is your DNA literally getting damaged, oxidized, just like an apple that gets rusty, right? It's oxidation. The cells then physically manifest that. Your skin starts to sag, your hair turns white, things are mm -hmm. aging. The things that we now know, which nobody paid attention to, are the things that you just said. Voltage, frequency, oxygen levels, none of these things we're treating right? These are the root, root, root causes. We are not aligned with what we are wired for. Our, our genetic makeup is about a quarter million years old, right? So who we are today is the same as people from 250,000 years ago. Our habits are about 100 years old. In fact, our, the reality of today's habits when you look at food and environmental toxins is about 50 years old. So re things really change in the 1970s, right? Mm -hmm. But if you take that and think about 250,000 years of habits that our body is now expecting we are walking around in that context and then fast forward to this context, which we are not genetically evolved towards being in, you know, we, we can't handle it. So right. then, yeah, the frequency and the voltage and the oxygen and all the things you're mentioning, we don't expose ourselves to that. You don't wake up and walk on the grass. You don't get sunshine in the morning. You don't hear rivers. You don't hear birds chirping, right? All of these things are frequency. All of these things affect you at the cellular level. Mm -hmm. So I, as a treatment, will walk out my backyard down into a ravine and just go stand at the river. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll do that once a week. And I literally feel like I went in a sauna in terms of the mental health relief. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I know I d you had asked a different question about inflammation, but I'm talking about all the things that we don't consider are what make us unhealthy beyond just chemicals and food, et cetera, right? We're really out of our natural environment. Yeah, when you have a, a any piece of equipment that's wired to do a job and you force it down another path, it's not gonna work, right? It, we are all, you know, Ferraris that are being treated as dump trucks. <laughs> So we are wired to do a certain thing, but we're on we're on the wrong path. We're not designed for it, can't cope with it. There are animals, for example, that have the genetic ability to live in hydraulic acid. Like they can live in literally acidic environments because genetically they're wired for that. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They'll thrive in that, right? There's animals that can live underwater. There's it. We know all this stuff, but we are not designed for the way we live. That's why we're so sick. There's never been as much chronic disease yeah. ever as there is today. Do you think it's because I'm going to get a little taken in a slightly different direction? Do you think it's because it's happening so quick right now, or because genetic adaptation does happen to some degree? Here's my belief from what I can see is that animals and everything else around us around us evolves. I have not seen evidence of that in humans. I have not okay, seen let's go there. I mean, we're totally <laughs> gonna go. You you and I have had these kinds of conversations before, <laughs> but you know, I was really hoping my first question was really gonna be like, what is a human being? Because I wanted us to really drop into like slightly esoteric spaces sure. and then be able to extrapolate some like more tangible things that are happening in the here and now. But, you know, if we haven't seen true shifts in genetics with human beings, but you're saying in animals there have been? The, there's a genome and there's an epigenome. Mm-hmm. Genome is your code. This is the instruction manual that's in each one of your cells that tells yeah. your cells how to do their jobs. Different cells read different parts of the manual. So the heart cell becomes a heart cell, liver cell becomes liver cell. It read, only reads that page, right? Yep. So that's your innate code. Your epigenome is those genes expressing at different levels. I might have a eight out of 10 hormone gene, but because of what I ate or because of what I was exposed to, it's expressing at six out of 10 or nine out of 10. It got adjusted a little bit. So in animals, what we're seeing is that the actual genome, the genetic code, changes and a giraffe's neck gets longer and the ears get bigger and the wings get wider and the animal changes over time. In humans, what we're seeing is there's a set from mom and there's a set from dad. And I got two potential inputs and I just keep winning this or losing this lottery because it keeps getting passed down. There's, I can If there's a, a A and a B version, I could get an AA, a BB, or an AB. Game just keeps getting passed down, but there's only two options, A or B. So mm-hmm. next generation might be a BB or a BA or a AA. So they're getting bounced between these options and it's cyclical that they, they're just coming back to AA and AB, right? But the epigenome, this is something that we're seeing uniquely in humans, is arming us with inheriting our ancestors' experience. A, a, an amazing example of that is the Holocaust, where there's science clearly showing that the trauma that was experienced by the people in it is now present in the epigenome of the grandchildren of those people. Mm-hmm. So they are sensitive to that. They are, set, they, they, they are still experiencing the trauma of what happened at that time mm-hmm. because their genes are training them to be aware. There was such a significant, impactful thing that happened. I'm going to pass this code on to the next generation. I'm not going to change the genetics so they're not evolving, mm-hmm. but I'm going to pass this little cheat code to them so that they can support this problem that they might have again. You're saying and, that the base genome does not change, but the epigenome does? Yeah, yeah. And then that may change where two, three generations in, it's no longer needed and it doesn't, it goes back to sort of default, right? And that's kind of what we're seeing. Um, and it's, but in animals, we're seeing evolution. It's clear there. I haven't seen evidence of it in humans. We are who we are. We, we became who we are about a quarter million years ago. That's a whole other conversation about how we became who we are. <laughs> that is a good conversation. <laughs> yeah. My folks yeah. on this channel love to uh, hear about the esoterics. So yes. So essentially, it's hard to explain why at a time when we think we are at peak technology now, mm. some of us do, right? Uh, how is it possible that technology that we do not have access to seemed to have was implemented on our genome a quarter million years ago? What happened? There was a literal gene edit. We understand gene editing. We understand that it's possible to snip a section and either remove it or replace it. We can't yet do it. Right. The only human approved gene editing project that ever was ever done was on the eye in humans. It was for some rare genetic condition for the eye. Uh, and it's local. The jurisdiction is here, the eyeball. Right. So we don't yet know how to take your 50 trillion cells in your body, insert an edit and make sure every single cell manifests that edit. I thought we could do that. Is that what CRISPR is? Yes. But we so CRISPR, the technology exists, but we haven't done it in humans. Right, it, it doesn't happen, right? Meanwhile, it happened 250,000 years ago. 
Yeah. Meanwhile, we can't explain the pyramids. Meanwhile, yeah. we can't explain Goble we can't explain Goble Te Gobekli Tepe. Meanwhile, yeah. we can't explain a whole bunch of things. A whole bunch of things, right? So 250,000 years ago, there seems to be an edit in the genome that made us who we are. What what does that mean? That there was primates and then all of a sudden there was a species with complex speech, with a larger brain, with a bigger prefrontal cortex, and they were called humans. And when you say bigger skull, there are all of those, for those who dive into ancient history and see that there are skulls that have been found that are yeah. elongated and much larger and, and indicative of larger brains, surely. Are, have we regressed? What it looks like is the genome became what it was at that time and has just continued to be the same. Now, what we do with it, keep in mind, this this thing that we walk in and is a miraculous. The current reality of how we live is shutting off a lot of our capacity. You know, a, a lot of people are now experiencing a sort of evolution and consciousness and their ability to connect in ways that they couldn't before. Look at the past 250,000 years. We can't possibly believe that we are the pinnacle of that. There's people that maybe have achieved things in that level or that world, I should say, in terms of consciousness is that we, that we kind of lost and we now are coming back to. So if you look at something like... Our, the way our genes and our cells communicate with the environment around us. We're just starting to learn, but if you look at ancestral stories and things that we know, oh, all of a sudden that thing that sounded like a fairy tale, maybe it was true. And things like, for example, our mitochondria we think of as a energy source. So your, your body takes in oxygen and nutrition to create energy. And that's done at the mitochondria. And you create this battery called ATP and you can go use it whenever you need power. Your mitochondria does a lot more than that, which we don't talk about scientifically. It's actually a communication device. It's constantly trying to understand what's happening in your environment so that each one of your cells instantaneously is adjusting to get you at the max or optimal performance you need to be. Is there a threat? Is there a smell? Is there a lack of food? Like whatever's going on, your mitochondria signaling from cell to cell if I touch my forehead, instantaneously, at each one of my 50 trillion cells knows that that happened. Mm -hmm. right? And my mitochondria is creating that communication. We don't have any technology that's capable of that. So now it also does that externally. But what I was, the very first point was, I think we've lost some of that ability. Right? And we're now coming back to it. We're now understanding we are more than just this thing that we're inside. We have a field around us that we're connected to, right? So are you saying that it's not within our body that is that is informing us that there is something outside of our body that is helping in that is creating some kind of heightened communication? Both for sending and receiving. So what we just talked about was receiving. The mitochondria is constantly looking out for it's your defense system, just checking what's going on. Right. And communicating to yourselves so that your body constantly responds appropriately. So you're yeah. safe. You also send signals out. Now, we're hearing a lot of talk about manifesting and, you know, believing and mm -hmm. making things. How does your body actually do that? Uh, and it's funny because your fan, Kyra, uh, sent me a note saying that, oh, I talked about something that we talked about. And she, she didn't fully explain it, so I'll fully explain it. Yeah, this uh, is Kaya Ra for those who are listening that have um, listened to the Kaya Ra interview. If you haven't, you should. She's a really special human. She's incredible. Her story is amazing. And yeah, we just happened to stumble upon on this conversation. And she just said, oh, I talked about this thing and you need to remind me how it actually works. So I'm going to remind you all now. So your DNA is a code that tells your cells what to do. It is also a communication device. And this is known, by the way, by the CIA who uses this technology, but it's nowhere in the scientific literature. Right now, there's offices in the CIA where there's guys sitting that are being told to visualize a building that may be thousands of miles away and draw a picture of what's happening in that building so that the special forces know how to enter the building and bomb something, get a hostage back, whatever, right? Remote so they're view. able to, yeah, so the remote viewing, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. now that's the mitochondrial side, which is signaling mm -hmm. and receiving. Now the, the sending out. So your DNA, people have seen this image of this like spiral ladder, yep. right? That's what your genes look like. The The point where the rungs meet, meet the sides are actual, uh, that's your signaling device. So it actually happens at that point. And what happens is... Your thoughts, your beliefs, we know get sent out as frequency. The actual mechanism of that is through your genes. 
And I'm going to, at the end, tell you why this is so important. So your genes then at those specific points send out these signals. And by sending out those signals, you create your magnetic field, right? Now, the more you believe and the more powerful that signal becomes, yeah. right? And then that, that weight that you create in your magnetic field creates the gravity that draws those things towards you. And that's how manifest the, the actual physical mechanism of how manifesting works. You're literally creating weight in the magnetic field, just like a planet creates weight on, in the universal field, which draws gravitational force towards it. You do that mm -hmm. with, you know, whatever you're putting out there. So why mm -hmm. the, now I said that I'm going to tell you why this is so important that it happens at the DNA, because if you're not healthy, you can't do it. So what is health? Health yeah. is your cells not being inflamed, mm -hmm. right? That's the, it's health is not masking illness. It's the not being sick, the state of having no illness. That's health. So if you are eating the wrong foods, not taking care of yourself, exposed to chemicals, overstressed, undersleeped, and your cells are inflamed and your DNA is getting oxidized and damaged, you mm -hmm. can't connect with the field and you cannot put those thoughts out there because the DNA is not functioning properly, right? And this is why you'll see the healthiest people are often the most connected people because it's so easy for them to do. Their, their, their body is, you know, prime ready to put those signals out there. I mean, I've even noticed the reason why we connected in the first place was um, on breast implants and how yeah. you were doing all the research on the connection between genetics and the pathways that make breast implant illness a reality for some people. The implants were creating so much inflammation because my body was fighting so hard that even, you know, I've noticed just my body continuing. It's mm. been a year now and um, a year tomorrow. Oh wow! <laughs> and um, and uh, I rem and and my body has been continuing to reduce inflammation. And like one of the ways that it's been noticeable is just how much easier it is to get a vein. Like I still do so much yeah. work, and so like for a while after my surgery and even before, it was so hard to get a vein. And now that my inflammation is gone, my veins have like been able to relax and expand, and mm. they accept the catheter so much easier. So, and many, many other things, but that's just one of them I was just talking about with a friend. And cause I was in, um, Costa Rica with Dave doing stem right. cells and plasmapheresis. And, um, and so, you know, they got a, they got a vein five out of six out of seven times, one time they didn't, but, um, but <laughs> all of them they did. And they were using pretty big gauges, especially for, um, plasmapheresis, but, you know, inflammation, yes, is just, it just, it just seems like, and also the hormonal side, like how does it affect oh, yeah. the hormonal side so aggressively? Yeah. So you're, it's more the opposite. Your hormones are, so women have a whole other set of problem mm -hmm. that men typically don't have to deal with, which is estrogen toxicity. Mm -hmm. And I would say when it, when it came to the research that we did genetically, so what, what did we do? The, what was, what genes do was already understood. We didn't invent genetics. What we did was we said, how do we take this amazing science and apply it to the big problems we have? Cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease, diabetes. It wasn't doing that yet. If it wasn't a rare genetic condition, it wasn't much to do with this tool. So we did that by spending three years with 7,000 people, one by one by one, fixing each one of their problems to get to their why. Like if I can't truly solve your problem, I haven't used genetics properly. It should be personalized for you, right? And when we did that, the biggest area that needed the most help was female hormone health. Mm. So that's the area that the delta value between here's how bad it is and how good it could be, huge gap. Yep. And every woman was kind of told, well, you're a woman, you're supposed to have these problems, it's hormones, right? That you're supposed to have a crazy menopause and infertility and PCOS and all these problems, which no, you don't have to have if you understood the genetics of the hormone cascade. And what's that thing that makes it more difficult for women is there's something called estrogen toxicity. So when you make your hormones on a monthly basis, progesterone becomes testosterone, becomes estrogen. And in that cascade, you can do those at different rates and speeds. So fill different buckets at different levels. And once you finally fill the estrogen bucket, you then have three options, two, four, or 16 hydroxyestrogen. Two is the good clean stuff you want, four and 16 are toxic, 16 being more toxic than four. And a lot of the women we're seeing that are coming to us saying, I have fibromyalgia, I have infertility issues, endometriosis, crazy migraines, mood issues, they're making these two metabolites. Mm. Now, 
Why is this a problem of today's generation? Because the genome alone is not enough. The genome is, here's how your body works. Here's the red flag. Let's prioritize this. Now, we need to understand your epigenetic habits. What is your environment? What is your nutrition? What is your lifestyle? And the pairing of those two is your net result. And the reality is that today, the hormone disrupting threats are so prolific that there's so many more problems. So the women that were estrogen toxic in grandma's generation didn't get sick. They were, tro they were toxic, it caused some inflammation, but the body can handle some inflammation. Now the total load is so much that it's causing all these issues, including breast cancer. And this was a big thing we learned and we can now deal with that root cause and make sure that women don't get sick. Got it. So there are so many things in our environment like plastics and food and um, the air that we breathe from all of the chemicals being sprayed in the air to EMF disrupting frequencies. All of that. Um, all of those things, they, but especially um, the consumables like drinking out of plastic and the stuff in our food, that is estrogen, that creates more estrogen. Yeah, it's your body treats it as if it's additional estrogen, right? So it, it, that's why it's called estrogen mimic. So mm. it mimics estrogen. So it's not actually estrogen. When it enters your body, your body can gets confused, thinks it's estrogen. So genes turn on to convert it into that estrogen byproduct, which is toxic and inflammatory. Is and it also... Yes. Is it also kind of, uh, does it make, because estrogen is such a female hormone, mm -hmm. does it, is it kind of amping that up, like making more female? Like I think about female, like having curvier bodies or like, just like, does it continue to, does it make you more woman too? So that's what's happening to men. So that's kind because... of what I was going to ask next. Is, that <laughs> yes. what say, is this something that's happening to men? And is this yes. why perhaps we're seeing... Um, more shifting with men to women, whether it's through transitioning, does it shift men in more into so women? there's some that same cascade that I said, progesterone to becomes testosterone comes. Men do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. We just do it daily. Men have women, men have a daily cycle. Women have a monthly cycle. Same mm -hmm. exact cycle, and men are more likely to be more androgenized, more testosterone. Women are more likely to be more estrogenized. So yeah. now the answer to that question isn't a blanket answer. It depends yeah. on what your hormones look like. So mm -hmm. someone like you who's more androgenized, more chiseled features, petite frame, right? That's more testosterone. So that that's going to drive you from androgenized to call it what the typical estrogenized woman would have been, mm -hmm. right? Now, a woman who's already estrogen dominant is now going to not maybe get more curvier figures, but she's going to start to get some of the um, conditions like fibro fibromyalgia, endometriosis, mm -hmm. you know, crazy migraines, mood issues, because she's over estrogenized. And if she's also toxic, too much inflammation. Okay. What we're seeing with the men, um, the... I guess the, the the change in culture and the femininity around, around, among men, yeah, there's no surprise when you're taking what used to be a manly man, you know, and you're removing all of what creates testosterone, the fight, the vigor, the the training, the exercise, and you're sedentary. And so there's a funny thing with hormones. When you sort of lean forward and fight, that calls on your body to create more testosterone. When you create more testosterone, it calls on your body to lean forward and fight. And you get on this vicious cycle forward, right? Same is true the backwards, or the opposite, I should say. If you kind of lean back and like, I'm not going to do it, you get more estrogenized. The, the warrior versus the worrier, right? And so we all now have a warrior lifestyle, sit in a chair and type, right? And be afraid of everything. Uh, everything is a problem hmm. and don't train, don't fight, don't do anything politically incorrect, you know, tone yourself down. And so we're all going into this warrior mode, which is also an estrogen problem. All of us, right? So uh, the men that are out there saying, let's do something and rile ourselves up and become men. There's something to be said there in terms of not losing half of our gender, <laughs> right? What's the solution? Well, the solution, it's, it depends. I mean, if, if it's like, is it a pill? Yeah, there's pills. Or is it a culture shift? Yeah, that's probably necessary also. 
You know, we're, we're, there's some things we're trying to fix, right? There's some which need to be fixed. Inclusion. Yes, let's fix inclusion because there's some people, I have had two business partners uh, in the last few years that are both gay, right? And they need to be included and not be discriminated against, right? right? And, but the, but what is also true is a person who does isn't innately, you know, uh, by choice or by birth, Right. But more by influence of chemicals and hormones, right. and you know confusion, unnatural. unnatural, right? That was not their who they naturally are, right? Right. So you're you're taking away the identity of someone who actually is something, and then lending it to somebody to create confusion, uh, and a lot of that has to do with hormone disruption. We're seeing it over and over and over and over and over again. So the, to, to answer your question, the chemicals are disruptive. The birth control is disruptive. The Teflon coat and frying pans are disrupted. The plastics are disrupted. So understand that ancestral habits are the healthiest habits. That's what we are still wired for. Our bodies have not caught up genetically to cope with all of that. Plastics don't clear your body. They, they cause cancer and they just float around forever, right? Forever chemicals don't leave. Uh, it was about a month ago, I read this article about Lululemon pants being loaded with uh, fluorine, which is a forever chemical, which just doesn't leave. You know, And it's very specifically in the crotch lining, which is when you're sweating with an opening, taking in the fluorine, you know? Yeah, amazing, right? So um, just understanding, so to answer your question, understanding how prolific hormone disruption is in your environment and your food and everything you do, from the chemicals you're spraying on your tabletop to the pesticides in your lawn, mm. what is hormone disruptive, what is not? Understand that. Second is, it's so prolific that it may even be hard to manage even then. So you may decide that hormone treatment is beneficial for you, right? You may still want to be the manly man or the womanly woman. And you may want to take hormones because our reality, again, is not grandma's reality. Our genes are their genes, but our context is different. We're in a different bucket with different problems that we are not designed for. So mm -hmm. we need more intervention. We need more supplementation or whether it's hormones or even just things like DIM that slow down the estrogen pathway. Simple supplement. It's a broccoli extract, right? So it's a combination of these two things. Understanding the threats, eliminating them, understanding what you can do to add in supplement to turn the dial up on your capacity to be that person you were supposed to be. What about like the this area that scares me the most right now, which is our food and, you know the 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 scare of mrna being added into animals and foods for our consumption like what the hell's going on <laughs> that now does that edit, now is that going to go more towards again our sort of biological nature is this meant to affect our genetics so let me tell you a story right now in the state of missouri there is a bill that's trying to be passed. I think it's Bill 1169 that says that foods that have mRNA technology in them need labeling to warn people that this may alter your genome. And the current state is there's a lot of pushback by big food and big pharma. Why is there pushback if there's no problem? So since 2018, so mRNA, we know of it post-COVID, right? We think it's a brand new thing that landed in 2020. mRNA for pigs started developing in 2012. It's been used in pork since 2018. Yeah, the pork you've been eating since 2018 has mRNA technology in it. That's not a secret. Yeah, it's made by Moderna and Merck. Great. And and now, yeah, and now here's the really wonderful part of the story mm. is the way it was designed is there's a baseline uh, product, which is called the delivery method. And because it's mRNA and it's custom, they respond to each unique virus by creating this custom portion that then gets injected into that flock of pigs, right? That custom portion, which is the active portion, has no requirement for safety check from FDA. Oh. Because this, yeah, because this thing is approved, this baseline was approved, went through all the vigorous whatever is required. The It's a custom product. So how can we possibly approve a custom product? We have to immediately respond to whatever the new virus is. So this 
thing does not require approval. And this is why the state of Missouri, who's per trying to prevent, which is you know such a big part of their um, sort of their ecosystem, farming and agriculture, they're saying, no, we don't understand what this does yet. And you can't prove to us that it doesn't do what we're worried that it does. Please put a label. That's all we're saying in this bill to warn people. And there's major, major pushback. Why is there pushback? Because the, what is the label claim? This may alter your human genome. So if you have a signal, an mRNA signal that's designed to edit something, how do we know it doesn't stop at the animal it was injected in? If you're eating it? Well, why are they injecting the animal in the first place other than to give it to us? Is there a reason? Well, it's it, it's meant to be like an antiviral. So, you know, protecting. So they, they're, vaccines have been used in animals for some antibiotics, right? So they're just saying, here's a better way to do it. It's custom for the actual strain in that local farm or area. I see. Uh, yeah, I don't get it. It doesn't add up. You know, there's right now, there's over 100 million wild animals that are being injected with mRNA. Huh. In our, yeah. So basically just infect the planet. Because if they're wild, yeah. they're going to... They're yeah. not, okay, so yeah. but, and let me just like check and balance this real quick because you said that we haven't had our genes really changed since 250,000 years ago. So is this on an epigenetic level that we're being altered so, or is this a baseline genetic thing? So the scary thing is we don't know. Huh? We, we don't really know what this stuff does. Uh, but what we do know is CRISPR technology exists. And what we do know at the you know, uh, biotech level, me being in the biotech industry, mm -hmm. is it's not it's not ready for me to develop a product yet. Right. I, I have tried to make products like, for example, I know that I can prevent cardiovascular disease if I can alter the 9P21 gene, which gives you a more robust endothelial lining, the ar arterial walls. If I make your arterial walls stainless steel, you're not getting cardiovascular disease. So oh, I'm yeah, waiting I need for that. Because remember, yeah. I have terrible veins. You, I have you the do, worst, yeah. quality, worst quality genetic yes. veins. Yeah, but the so highest waiting... dopamine. So you know, you get a trade off. You got yeah, you get a little bit of good, a little bit of bad. So what <laughs> I'm trying to do is fix the bad, which is if I can make a CRISPR technology <laughs> product, gene editing, gene therapy, mm -hmm. then great, I can fix that problem. So I'm being told right now I can't do that. Meanwhile, um, we don't know who has access to what, right? Uh, the, the, in theory, CRISPR works. So is it that it's not yet available, or is it just not yet available to me? Right. Sure. So that's the fear. We don't know what it does yet. And and what we the, the fear is that it does edit your genome. What is the edit? What are what's trying to be edited? I don't know. You know, we really don't know yet. Um, but the the usage and the the like why are one hundred million wild animals being injected in our American forests? For what purpose? Like I I I don't get it. I don't understand. Untrackable. The of that. Um, I don't know. Like just yeah. or just like worldwide vaccination worldwide yeah. think something to be said about shedding which is not um proven here or this way or that way but i can tell you that i work with practitioners mm -hmm. uh that are not vaccinated that in toronto there's a lot of where i am in toronto there's a lot of nhl hockey training i work with a lot of the doctors that work with the hockey players and i know some of them who are never been vaccinated that had extreme vaccine injury from working with the hockey players who had just been vaccinated, which means that they were shedded on, right? So the extent and the whys behind all this stuff, we don't really know. But we do know that it's in our pigs and it's soon going to be in our chickens and they're really fighting to make sure it doesn't get in our beef. Uh, but it looks like we're going in that direction. The worst thing is the plants, by the way. It, the easiest way to transmit it is through plants, much easier through, than animals. The technology already yeah. exists, it's already been going on. So, and it's so, that's the thing where it's just so easy to do. You know, it's it's in everything, it's in all Is that foods. because it goes into the soil and spreads and or is that because of the wind and blowing seeds around? I mean, what, what is it, why is it uh, No, the, the technology to get it into plants is just oh. much simpler. Right? Oh. It's just a very, it's already happening. It's a very oh. easy thing to do. Yeah, it's a very simple, easy way to go about and it's already happening. What about stem cells? Stem cells and peptides. I'm really curious about what they're doing. So peptides are call it somewhere in between a supplement and a drug, right? That's a that's a peptide. So it's not quite supplementing. It's not food, and it's also not as potent and condensed as a drug. It's something in the middle, right? And 
so if you're going beyond here's my mitochondrial supplement or my vitamin C and you want to be more aggressive on a very specific biological pathway, yeah. there's typically a pi peptide for every biological pathway. So you can focus on, I can't sleep, my hormones are screwed up, you know, I get numbness in my fingers, whatever. There's some, there's a peptide to fix everything. Stem mm -hmm. cells are the only cell that can become any other cell. They're regenerative. So what does regenerative mean? We every day are losing and making three to four million cells in our body every day, right? And we be become a new version of ourselves every once in a while. This person you see here didn't exist a year ago. This is all brand new material, right? So stem cells can go do that for you. And so regeneration means damaged tissue, uh, inflame, inflamed tissue, inflammation, right? So anything that is breaking down wear and tear, um, I have, for example, a shoulder injury and I saw on, under an ultrasound the actual muscle tear, right? So that's a perfect example of put some stem cells in there and it will just regenerate and repair the tissue because stem cells can become any kind of tissue and they go around trying to fix things. That's what they do. So there's other technologies like that coming. I think I hinted to you about uh, a gene therapy that we're trying to work on right now. There's a gene called FOXO3 that we test for. And FOXO3 is a superhuman gene where this process where I talked about where your, your body is eliminating cells and creating new cells all the time, getting rid of mutated dying cells and making good fresh ones. Uh, FOXO3, if you have a certain version of it, allows you to do that at like a hyper efficient pace. Mm -hmm. Right. So you become it's the person that's like 80 years old riding their bike that looks like they're 50. I want to be that girl. So now that's why I want to make this gene therapy so I can turn. That's a very healthy way to use this technology. If right. we know this gene allows us to do that. And if I can create a gene therapy that gives you the efficient version of that gene, you can now innately do that. And it lasts like two to three years and you keep redoing it, redoing it. So there's amazing stuff coming down the pipeline in terms of biotech. So. Do we know, because I did your DNA test, um, do we know, do you know through that testing if I have that gene or not? I do. You do? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, let's find out. I can literally check right now as we oh talk. Oh my God, that's so fun. So for yeah. while, you're, while you're looking that up, um, we'll get into this next because this is fascinating and I feel sure. like, I don't think there's a single human being that wouldn't want to, I don't think that anyone would not want to know, um, but Cashif developed a DNA test that tests for, and I'm going to have you go through basically the basic sort of buckets that you test for, like um, neurological and hormonal and all of those things for, for what you are looking for. Um, and so I was able to learn so much from Cashif about just you know, certain supplementation based on my genetics and um, what I need, what, again, like you said, fix what's wrong so that you yeah. can live better and longer. Um, and so that's why I knew that little tidbit about my veins being a very low quality. Uh, genetically, I have very low quality vein walls, wall, the wall, the, the wall or the, the vein itself. But we found out that I have the highest amount of dopamine receptors. So, <laughs> yeah. and then we were also looking for the breast implant illness pathways as well, which include the endocrine system with the hormones and how I, you know, how, how much hormone comes in if I, if I clear that hormone or not, um, as well as various other things. So, um, after you tell me if I'm superhuman or not, then we can get to, uh, the test itself because I just think everyone should do this. So we need to edit in a drum roll and there it is. You have one copy of the superhuman gene. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. So either mom or dad gave it to you. Okay. And either one of them gave you the normal, which is still excellent, which means that, um, and we can see it. I mean, looking at you, you have this youthfulness around you, right? So it just means you're going to age a little slower than a typical person. So it doesn't mean you go abuse yourself and, you know, but it does mean <laughs> that you're, you're, you know, it just, your, your cells are going to be healthier and younger for longer. You, you stay ahead of that. I'm aging process. So you can have two maximum is you can have both of them from the mom and the dad. Yeah. And I've got one. Yeah. So here's the pace that humans are supposed to do it. You're doing it like 30% better. And then if you have two copies, it's like 50, 60% better. Oh my gosh. That's so great. Is that awesome? I mean, that's cool. <laughs> um, all right, great. Um, so, okay, let's talk about the test because I think it's fascinating. Yeah. So really what we've understood is that, first of all, 
this was developed because I was sick and I don't come from the industry, right? So I, I was in the in the marketing and PR business. I used to help startup companies grow. It's what I love doing, taking an idea, making it into something, helping that team exit their company and then move on to the next one. Now you're doing it and, for yourself. Yeah, now I'm doing it for myself because I found something that felt like my legacy. It felt like this is so impactful. First of all, I healed my whole family. Then I started healing my friends. Then I started healing people that were calling in. I was like, this is really important. So what happened? I had eczema, psoriasis. Eczema was so bad, by the way, that I couldn't open my left eye. It was like sealed shut. Mm -hmm. My psoriasis was so bad that my knuckles, when I would clasp like this, they would bleed. Mm -hmm. I had gut issues, uh, depression, because my dopamine is the exact opposite of, of, of yours, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I had uh, migraines. That was the worst part. I right. used to Literally couldn't function, horrible, horrible, intense migraines. I used to vomit from the pain. That's how bad it was. I've so, been yeah, yeah. So now, and you, of mm -hmm. course, loaded with the BII also, you know, that mm -hmm. makes it even worse, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, actually, uh, holy shit, totally, cash up, totally. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. when I had my implants that I was getting migraines. Yeah, inflammation. And I would, right. I was racing still, and I thought it was, um, I thought maybe I was getting carbon monoxide poisoning, and that wasn't it. I was checking everything, and basically, like I think my just my load was so high that yep. it was so easy to tip it over into bigger expressions like a migraine. Like I could have sometimes it happened just on its own, but usually if I if I had one drink of alcohol on Sunday yep. night after a race, guaranteed two day two day migraine, which did one time end up in me throwing up. Yeah, so because what's happening is your body can handle inflammation. Yeah. Here's your inflammation bucket. Yeah. But because of your implants, you were already full, yeah. right? So you just needed one thing to push you over the edge and you were just constantly teetering at this full line because of the the low, that inflammation load. So yeah. anyways, I kind of experienced the same thing. One of the big discoveries for me was when it comes to detox of the gut, there's a gene called GSTM1. I don't even have it completely missing from my genetic code. So when you're eating pesticides, chemicals, all this stuff, it goes directly into my bloodstream, causes crazy inflammation, which is why I had the eczema and the migraines, mm -hmm. right? Um, I also, uh, when it comes to hormones, I make a lot of toxic testosterone. So I make a lot of testosterone, which is great, but I wasn't working out properly like I used mm -hmm. to when I was young. Mm -hmm. And so this toxic byproduct called dihydrotestosterone, which is actually mm -hmm. a potent version if you use it properly, if you train, uh, was also causing me inflammation. There was a number of other things. So I healed myself. I got my arthritic mother out of bed who literally was bedridden. She now goes to the gym and trains, you know, and drives around in her car, does her own groceries. So started to heal. And I realized medicine is broken because when I was going to the doctor, you know, five different problems, taking five different pills from five different doctors. The the real aha moment for me was when I was asking, why did this happen? Right? There, there must be something. All these things just happened all at the same time at this age. I was 38 at the time. Mm. Why? Did I eat something wrong? Did, and I understood that that wasn't in their toolkit. They didn't they didn't even figure out why. For, 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 forget about giving me an explanation. It's like, that's not what they do. So I did it myself. And I, and I figured it out and I figured out through my genome that there's certain jobs my body just doesn't do, which is why I got so sick, which is why my mother couldn't get out of bed, which is why my niece ran away from home with anxiety issues and is now flourishing as a straight A student. She would have been on anxiety pills if I didn't understand genetically what was going on with her, right? Uh, which is why my best friend at the time had a cholesterol problem that he couldn't understand, even though he was a pharmacist, he couldn't deal with it, which we then got rid of, he's no longer on medication, right? So we started to learn and fix. And from there, uh, we built the panel. Dave was actually very helpful there. He helped in terms of the solution side. So. I now know how the body works and I know I know what to tell you to do. You need to focus on this system, whether it's your hormones, whether it's your brain, whether it's whatever, and go support it. Dave then helped me with what do we do about it? What is the right supplement? What is the right activity? What is the right oxygen treatment, et cetera? And that's mm -hmm. now built into the reports. Then we went into, uh, well, how do we actually get people to do things? Because I can't talk to everyone. Our, our scientists and clinicians can't talk to everyone. So we went to a gentleman named Dr. B.J. Fogg, who wrote a book called Tiny Habits. So he write, he runs the Stanford University Behavioral Change Lab. So he's a guru when it comes to behavior change. And we said, here's our reports. Here's all the recommendations. Go make people do it. So now he built the behavioral change components right into the reports. So it's very easy to learn yeah. and implement and change. Oh, yeah. And we now, you know, whether it's I can't sleep at night, 
whether it's I have mood issues, burnout, procrastination, addiction, whether it's I don't feel well as a woman, you know, I have hormone issues, infertility, et cetera. Whether it's why is it every time there's a common cold, I'm the only one in the house that just can't get through it. You know, mm -hmm. my immune system is shocked. Mm -hmm. uh, why do I whether have cancer? Why do I have cancer? Yeah, why me, right? We, I did exactly what my sister did. Why did I get it? right? Mm -hmm. um, and then it's diet nutrition. Should I be keto? Should I be vegan? I can't tell you how many vegans we'd have to tell them, this is why you're sick. And with empirical evidence, because the genes that create the enzymes to break down the lentils and beans and all your key protein sources, they just don't make. The genes that drive them, we can see, are broken, right? Um, so everything about diet, nutrition, fitness, etc. So how does this thing work, right? What jobs does my body do well, so I can, I know I don't need to do anything about that. What jobs does my body not do well? And now what could that lead to? All these prongs of symptoms that I complain right. about. The symptoms mm -hmm. aren't the problem. It's a system failure. If I deal with that, all the symptoms go away. And that's what we've kind of figured out. Yeah. Yeah. The portal is so easy to use. Um, obviously, I'm fortunate to know you. You can <laughs> read my report for me. But, um, but, the, but the portal itself that you've created with the um the categories of testing of genetic testing and pathways and um that it is so easy to click on and use and see what you need to do see what you're good at see what you're bad at um and then <clears throat> is there still a separate sort of report that can be sent to a doctor that's a more detailed x a, 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 um, uh, a more detailed and, and, and higher volume amount of calls to action that your doctor can look at because that was one part of it too yeah, so one challenge on our end is we know a lot more than what's in the report, right. but we aren't allowed to say it because of regulatory issues. So just Stop FDA, it. yeah. Well, I mean, I can't tell you that I see breast cancer coming, even though I see breast cancer coming because that's diagnostic, right? Um, so, yeah, but I can tell you that you're estrogen dominant and estrogen toxic and then teach you what that means. And then you can use that tool in all your problems. Right. So that's one thing about your DNA is that it's not a one time blood pressure or cholesterol it, number. It's a here's my instruction manual. I go back to it for every decision I have to make. I, I go from puberty age to fertility age to menopause age. Those are three very different phases where I have to make different decisions. I go back and reinterpret for that context. Right. I can still go back to this thing because my DNA doesn't change. So, yes, so so now to answer your question, so there is a clinician report which does have more recommendations, more clinical language that we can directly to say to a consumer. So click a button, goes to your practitioner, and then, then they, they can then, if you want to, dive deeper. We also have practitioners that are trained to do this. So if you want our coaches to do things, they can. Uh, but mm -hmm. if you have a coach that you like, like working with, yeah, just push a button and it sends them a clinical report. Where Where is the future of regenerative and preventative medicine going? Like what framework do you see? Because I feel like you're on the leading edge of personalized medicine. So yeah. where is it going? I see the, the, the current conflict we have continuing in a different battlefield, which is right now we have medicine, which is go do whatever you want. And when you break yourself, the doctor will fix you. Right. That's medicine. Right? right. Versus functional medicine, which is let's understand why disease happens and make sure you never get sick. Mm -hmm. So two very different ways to think about your health. Both mm -hmm. exist today. It's your choice which one you do. The, why people fall in the other bucket is because the financial structure, the incentives behind what does my insurance actually cover and pay for are all in the first bucket of wait to get sick and mask it. Because right? mm -hmm. the insurance companies and pharma, they're all intertwined. It's all the same thing. Mm -hmm. So this you have to pay out of pocket, but what better thing to pay for than your health, right? So that same thing is now happening in regenerative and the future of medicine. And here's a perfect example. You've probably seen this gentleman uh, who's saying that he reversed his age 10 years and he spent $2 million on himself. Have you seen him? Uh, he kind of looks like uh, an elf from Lord of the Rings. The best way We're to describe him. We're not talking him. about David Sinclair, are we? Not David Sinclair. No, <laughs> uh, younger guy. Uh, I'll get you his name, but anyway, most people would have heard of him. It, it just recently, he's been uh, on different podcasts in the media talking about he reversed his age biologically by ten years. And by the way, everybody can do the same. I've done the same. I can teach you how easy that is. When I started this journey, I was thirty-eight, and my biological age was forty-three because I was pretty sick. Yeah, I am now forty-three. 
and my biological age is 33. Huh? So I, Holy shit. Yeah. And I've been 10 and it's, and it's been 33 for the last two years. Right. So, so it's been st kind of staying there. So, and this is measuring epigenetic expression. The thing we talked about yep. me measuring, uh, aortic stiffness. So cardiovascular age, you can do a Doppler scan on your arteries to understand how much plaque there is. So there's a way to determine biological age. And I've been able to reverse and maintain that for a little while. So, and it didn't cost me the $2 million that this guy's talking about. So, now the how now the thing that I was saying that the current conflict is now being translated into this future of medicine. What he's saying is, if you spend two million dollars with me, I will reverse your age, right? And he's building an industry out of that, which is great, but he's doing it in a way that is reactive, mm -hmm. right? It's like mm -hmm. you go do whatever you want. I'm not mm -hmm. going to change your diet. I'm not going to. I have all these tools and tricks and technology that are going to bring your age down, but then you're going to go right back to your habits mm -hmm. and you're still going to be inflamed and you're still going to have bad mood issues and your gut and your brain are still connected. And when you eat wrong, you're still going to have a bad day in the brain, right? Wow. So all these things, if you don't heal, and so the path that I choose to take is to slowly adopt better habits yeah, yeah, and not to do it all in one day yeah, and to every day add a new thing and add a new thing and add a new thing. And eventually you become from I'm trying to get better to I go to the gym to I'm a health enthusiast to health is my hobby to I'm a biohacker, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. To how do I live to 150? Yeah. So you, you, right? right? That's where I'm yeah. at. Okay. Maybe Dave yeah. wants 150. I think Dave wants 180. I'm calling yeah. 120. I'm good with 120. Um, so finish your thought and then I want to talk about telomeres. Yeah. So there, there's plenty of science to say to support what you're saying that 120 is the age, right? Our bodies are designed to live to that age. And I think our ancestors used to until we got so sick, we stopped living that long, right? These phases of learn all the red flags, whether it's through your genetics or through your gut microbiome, learn the things that your body is failing at, because that's going to be the foundation of what causes your accelerated aging or your disease, the two things you don't want and you don't have to have, mm -hmm. by the way. Mm -hmm. Then you start to understand, what do I do? What are the habits? How specifically do I need to eat? Is keto the right choice for me? Maybe it's not, right? Maybe I cycle on and off of carnival, which by the way, is the right choice for me. I can't stick to keto, I'll get sick. But when I do it for a few weeks, I feel amazing. I need to cycle on and off, right? So what are the right choices? And you start to adopt those habits and you start to become that health enthusiast. This becomes a priority, mm -hmm. right? And then, and then, yeah. 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 And you, you start to understand that every choice you make is either a step towards health or a step away from health. Mm -hmm. Every single choice you make and everything you do, right? And when you get to that point, then you're the biohacker. That's when you start looking at things like stem cells and oxygen. Because if you haven't got the terrain ready, right? If you haven't spent the year or two to optimize yeah. the terrain, you're putting stem cells into a body where you're not going to benefit from it. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the, there's benefit. I'm not going to say zero, but you're spending twenty, thirty thousand dollars on a treatment to get twenty percent of what you could have got a hundred. Yeah, right? yeah. So I mean, even for me, when I went and did stem cells just a couple of weeks ago, um, they recommended based on the fact that I have mold and metals and various different things still I'm getting rid of um, that it's better to harvest my um, stem cells, do a stem cell harvest um, next time. Like mm. get the stem cells. So I got stem cells intravenously. Um, and then next time my body is a little bit bet more right. healthier. It's a little bit in better shape to want to want to keep those. So actually, essentially me being older will be better because I'll have less inflammation. I will have healthier cells. I will be in a better condition. So essentially I'm probably going to be younger next year. And yes. that's a better point in time to take my stem cells to then use to regenerate, to, to give to me over and over again. So I'll have like 41 or 42 year old stem cells then forever after that. Yeah. So you're, you're... let's go a little esoteric. Sure. You have to. We <laughs> barely did at the beginning. I thought we were going to go all the way down the path of extraterrestrial <laughs> intervention. Um, but. Telomeres. So is it yeah. true? So you were talking about obviously 250 years, thousand years ago is when we have a gene splice edit, something what seem what I've heard is sort of unexplainable. We don't understand why there is a splice in the gen in the genetic coding. Um, mm -hmm. and that uh that telomeres are capped 
And is that something that's outside that that seems that appears to have been done to us? And then also, is it true that they're capped for us to live to 120 years only? Up until literally a couple of years ago, the only uh, thinking around telomeres was here's your DNA. Right. And remember at the very beginning, I was saying your DNA getting damaged is a definition of aging. That's yeah. that's what it, your cells unravel. Your DNA gets damaged and you age. So the telomeres are like bumpers. So they protect your DNA. And so telomeres have been a, a marker for biological age because yeah. the more worn down they are, yeah. the more you've abused your DNA. And that's how old you actually are biologically. Right. But this is based on these various algorithms and clocks that assume we can get to 120. So if you look at our innate biological function and structure, we are beings that are designed to live to 120. And those telomeres mirrors are meant to last until that age. So there's there's two things. Why is there a cap? Is is it is it to protect us, which we think it is, or is it to cap us? Which one which one is it? Because isn't is there stories in ancient history, Bible even, where people live for several hundred, six, seven, eight hundred years? Yeah, every ancient tradition talks about people living for centuries. right? And, and we're seeing evidence of that. I mean, you've spoken to plenty of people that have evidence of that. So what happened? Is it that we have something that we evolved into to protect our DNA? Or since there was a magic edit, was there also a magic cap installed to limit how how old our DNA, how many years our DNA can actually last. So we in science, we're reacting to everything. So we found this thing and we say, no, it's a bumper, it's a protector. And if we measure it, we know how old we are. But if we dig deeper and we start to look at what we've learned historically, there's plenty of content that's not from 2023 that was from, you know, minus 20, 250,000, right? That tells us otherwise, that people did live longer. Um, and it's it's, not it's too coincidental that different people in different parts of the world that never spoke to each other all say the same thing mm -hmm. right that doesn't make any sense mm -hmm. so um and it's not that we just live longer they're, they're very specific about the like six to eight hundred years thing and they're from different parts of the world at different times up until recent history the recent recorded history which is what you learn in school is when this ends this story ends kind of kind of post christ type history right? Everything be before that is a blur. To us, it's not a blur if you look at ancient texts that are available. We just aren't taught it, right? And it's a very different story if you look at this stuff. So it's a question mark. Is this telomere protective or is it a cap? It seems like it's both. Could those stories have been off-planet extraterrestrial or hybrid beings that did live six, eight hundred years, but we, this we as a homo sapien sapien or whatever we are um human being we only have ever lived a certain amount of time which seems to be much shorter is that that could be possible too so if there was a technology a quarter million years ago that took a primate and edited two parts of the genome to make us who we are somebody with some intelligence had to do that and it wasn't us. <laughs> exactly. Right? It, it That was not evolution. Evolution doesn't happen in an edit. It takes millions of years. Since that time, we have not seen evolution in ourselves. Right? So how did that happen overnight? That was a cause. That was, that was intentional. So I don't know if the answer is the Lord came down and edited us, right? And created us. Is the answer that there's another species from another planet or from this planet that maybe is still here somewhere that we don't know about, right? So what? But what's clear is that the way we became who we are was not the way every other species became who they are. It was not we did not evolve into it. We became it. There was a switch that was turned on that was immediate, and that was two edits to diff two different parts of our genome that are clear that no scientist can dip dispute exist. They just don't want to talk about why it happened. Nobody's trying to investigate why it happened. What the F is junk DNA? So junk DNA are sections of your genetic code that have no information. Which to me, in the perfection of this human body, the complexity of this human body, there's no room for junk. Right? So 
it's just if you're programming something and there's certain code that you don't need anymore, you turn it off. So at the time, if we feel that there was an edit, who edited us? I think you have some theories there, right? There was also junk and junk wasn't added. It, it seems like there's literal sections of our DNA, which we don't know what they do because they're turned off that are literally off. So it's as if you had a line of computer code and somebody took a portion of it and censored it. And how can you save the difference between deleted and censored? Uh, because it's still there. Is right? there so structure? What, There's still structure? Yeah, it's There's structure. No, it's, yeah, like it's, what's the difference between DNA that you can see versus the junk DNA that is empty, essentially? What does it look like tangibly? So it is encoded. Right. So there's there's letters that uh, there's four letters, A, B, C, T, that yeah. make up your genetic code. And there's many, many combinations. Right. Each each gene is thousands of letters long. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then so sometimes there's a C instead of a T. And now that gene doesn't do its job properly in okay. a certain location. So there's no code in the junk. It's it's literal junk. But how is, do you see the code? How do you even see a code? Uh, so that's sequencing. So now we're getting into when. So I take your saliva, which I did. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> and I extract your DNA from the saliva. There's a tool that does that, and we then put that DNA into a sequencing machine, which literally knows how to read the code on every chromosome and every. So that that's how it, it's literally read, right, by the sequencing machine. Okay. Illumina is the biggest company that does that. Most companies use Illumina, uh, and when you're sequencing it, this section can't be read. There's nothing to read. There's no code. So. And, and, and again, if there's nothing in this body that isn't purposeful, yeah. right? There's nothing that isn't purposeful. And yeah. something as precious and, you know, a fundament, foundational, sorry, as our genetic code, right. Right. having space spaces, like empty spaces, there's, there's a purpose there. And the purpose is either it used to exist and it was turned off. Yeah. Or we don't know how to turn it on. Right. Well, as you know, from our friend Kaya, part of her book, The Sophia Code, is about verbal initiations that activate dormant DNA. And that makes sense to me because we talk about elevating consciousness. Mm -hmm. We don't understand the science, like the practical mechanism of what happens. What If you elevate consciousness, which means you're now sending and receiving what you couldn't send and receive before. That means that those antennas or whatever those things are, are now activated. Mm -hmm. You didn't have access to them prior to that. Mm -hmm. So that could be that. Maybe there's certain sections of our DNA turn off to prevent us from accessing a certain level of consciousness that we can fight and turn on. I've experienced this. You've talked, we talked to you about this. You've experienced this. In the last two years, I've experienced more of this than the rest of my life combined. You know, there's there's shifts happening right now that if you're yeah. on the right path, you're going to experience it for sure. Yeah. Uh, and it's there. So it'd be interesting to see, you know, I'm going to do this now, now that you said this. I'm going to keep working on elevating my consciousness and I'm going to resequence my DNA to see if something's changed that didn't exist before. Oh my God. Or can you see what percentage of your body has active DNA versus unread? Is there... Right, because so if, if you're re you're reading some, but some doesn't read. So if you gave a if you had a, a sample, can it can can it evaluate a ratio? So every cell in your body is has DNA in it. So every single right. cell has active DNA. There's very little junk DNA. It's micro. And there's little fragments here and there that are junk. Okay. Still yeah. some junk in there. Um. All right, you have a book. Okay, what's the book called? So the book is called The DNA Way, and Early on in this journey, you know, when we built the company, we were still a research company at the time. Biotech is a weird place to be because you learn and you don't even know why you're learning yet. Like, what is what is the product going to be? It doesn't even matter. We're just researching and that's where we were. And so I realized as I was doing this that we needed to normalize DNA as a tool. People don't even know that it has to be part of your health toolkit. If you don't understand your foundational code, how do you make every other decision? Sure. You're going to trial and error, one size fit all things until they work. And so um, I found, I was recommended this book agent who represents 80 best-selling medical type authors. And he said, I love your story. You need to write a book. I agree with you. And then he came back to me after paying him for four or five months. And he said, you got rejected by every single publisher that exists because you're not a doctor. And I said, well, I told you up front that I'm not a doctor. And I told you up front that what I'm trying to fix is the healthcare system. 
and it takes somebody from the outside to see what's what with the blinders on what everybody can't see right he said i'm sorry it, this isn't working so i said give me the list of who rejected us right and i said thank you you know here's your check thank you for your time i'll deal with this myself so i i found of that list of publishers somebody who represented a few authors that i like that i enjoy including mindy by the way right uh, mindy pals uh, and i called them and within three days i had a book deal <laughs> yeah that's great that's so <laughs> yeah great. and because they didn't i mean what we do is so impactful but the, him as a guy that represents 80 doctors thinks like the doctors know he himself couldn't get out of that medical thinking right like so right. anyways so the 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 intention was the purpose of this book is for me to go through my personal genome and show how easy it is to use these tools and change your life i've changed my life i've gone from a 38 year old that was 43 biologically to a 43 year old that is 33 biologically I'm the best shape of my life mentally, physically, in every way, even spiritually. My ability to connect is beyond what it's ever been, right? Uh, and so I wanted to share that with everybody because whether you have a test or not, there's things to learn in terms of how does the science work? What can you do? There's things that you'll start to clue into and you'll see the world differently. You'll see pe people differently because you'll understand how your body actually works. Cash, if you're brilliant, you're a good friend and you're changing lives. And I'm so grateful that we're friends and that we're sharing this information. You're sharing this information. I'm just like sitting here. It's a pleasure. I, <laughs> I mean, I learn, I learn just as much from you as you, as we, as you say you're learning today. I'm going to tell you something. Your interview with Billy Carson <gasps> is the only podcast that I listen to in my life from beginning to end without shutting it off or pausing. <laughs> Love it. Thank you. Yes. And, and I've heard him on other podcasts. Your the way you navigated it, your questions, like you are brilliant. And it's we, ha we have to say that. that I've mm -hmm. never done that ever with any podcast. It was um, it was awesome. That's very, very nice of you to say. Billy is a fascinating guy with yeah. um, just like you, very, very intelligent, um, retains a lot of information and is um, another person that's leading the way um, forward, just like you are. So, um, but thank you. Billy's great. You're great. The show is so fun. It's my guilty pleasure. <laughs> just talk to people I love. <laughs> Amazing. All right. Thanks, Kasia. Thanks, everybody, for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.